Okay, great. Let's get this conversation started. Um, so I just want to go over, obviously, this is a difficult topic to talk about. Um, you know, in 2021, the maternal mortality rate for black women hovered around 70 deaths per 100,000 live births. And as everyone probably on the stage knows, uh, black women uh, die um, from pregnancy at three times the rate of, of white women. And so I want to start with you, Dr. Maisha. Can you talk to us about how we got here? Sure. Um, well, first, let me say thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be part of the discussion today. And in terms of how we got here, I mean, there's so many, it's multifactorial in many ways, but I think the route that I always go to is systemic racism. And what does that look like? And how does that play out as it pertains to policies, as it pertains to access for women of color, as it pertains to opportunities for patient empowerment? I mean, so when we dig deep, we really have to look at the data around access. We have to look at the data around who is going to medical school, who is interacting with women um, as they are entering into this critical time in their lives and on this journey, um, and really start to unravel that and think about how do we then combat systemic racism at every layer within um, the healthcare ecosystem. So I'd start there. I totally agree with that. Anytime I hear this question of like, how did we get here? I'm generally asking, well, how far do we want to go? Mm. How far back do we want to go? Because when we're talking about being in a country that is rooted in white supremacy and cis heteropatriarchy, um, a country that has never intended for us to live and thrive and survive, there are some things that are systemic, are institutional, that contribute to this horrible maternal health care crisis that we're in. And it's you know, when we're talking about maternal health, we're talking about the whole spectrum of reproductive health care experiences that folks experience every single day. So, yeah, it goes back way far. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me um, and to the audience for coming to engage. You know, I, I also agree with my colleagues about this, that you know, I, it's rooted in the legacy of slavery and of systemic racism in this country. It's no surprise that we're seeing the maternal health outcomes and other health outcomes that we're seeing today, even despite advances in technology, innovation, and research. We have to look at the practices and policies that got us here. So, you know, as a physician, I think about even the history of medicine, how, um, you know, people who are physicians who are revered, who have been revered, were the same physicians who experimented on enslaved black women. Right, so J. Marion Sims, I'm sure many of you have heard about him by now, but he was the um, president of the American Medical Association, which, which is the oldest and largest organization of physicians in this country. So someone who was deeply respected, deeply revered, who up until a few years ago had a statue in Central Park across from the New York Academy of Medicine. So that has been since taken down, but this is, these are the people that we are revering. And then even, you know, fast forward thinking about how even within medical schools, black people were you know, put on display, we were still experimented on, we were essentially, we've been just dehumanized. And so there are many occurrences with, within history where the institution of medicine has violated the right, respect, dignity, dignity of black people. Um, and then I think about even how the medicalization of, of birthing, how you know, we have had there's a, a policy, I mean, it was, in, I think, I believe in 1921, called the Shepherd Towner Act that essentially led to the erasure of midwives, it associated them with unsanitary um, and unhygienic practices, even though birthing, um, uh, birth rates among midwives was, was quite high. But because of policies like that, it really led to the erasure of midwives, and um, it changed the way that birthing happened in our communities. So instead of it happen happening at home, which you know the majority of people, the first time that they get birth, qualify for at home birthing, right? Instead, it happens in the hospital. And when, when you deliver in the hospital, that's associated with more complications. You, you're more likely to have a C-section, you're more likely to have an epidural, even though you may not necessarily need it. Um, so we have to make, make sure that we are recognizing, just like in every other social institution, that we didn't arrive here by accident, that it was a series of intentional policy decisions that um, 
definitely did not center black people and have ended up harming us and continue to harm us. We got here because we do not value both black people and women in this country. If you think about the founding of the United States of America, the fact that black people were considered two thirds human, that white women had to have permission of their husbands to get birth control in the 1960s. So when you add both anti-blackness and patriarchy together, what you get is the worst maternal health outcomes in the industrialized world. I trained at, um, in a deeply Southern medical school, state funded, where 30% of the population is black. And yet with our tax dollars, I was taught in medical school in the 1990s, which is not that long ago, although my 30 year old daughter would say, mommy, get over it, it's been a while. But in the 1990s, I was taught that there were three biological races in my embryology class that was not named embryology, it was named human prenatal development. So in my human prenatal development class, where we I saw pictures and moved videos of fetuses being, feeling pain. We also were taught that there were three types of skin, mongoloid skin, caucasoid skin, and negroid skin. So if I was taught this by my professors in the 1990s, what does that mean that we're teaching across the globe? Because we export our eugenics, our white supremacy, and our patriarchy to other countries. Our textbooks, just like the textbooks that they're changing in Florida, those are the textbooks that we were using in medical schools today across the United States. So we're teaching eugenics. So when you teach eugenics, as Dr. Uche mentioned, you get the outcomes of white supremacy, which is that black women die. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm gonna, oh, please go no, ahead. No, no, I just, and of course, Dr. Joy makes me think um, just even more about, you know, how things are not so, you know, historical, that they, they, they're very much current day. So even, you know, there's a, a study that came out in two, six, 2016 out of UVA showing that medical students and residents um, agreed or thought that these false myths about black people in pain were true. So that we are biologically different, that we have thicker skin, that we have less sensitive skin, and then when they asked them to make decisions about patient care, they were more likely to rate the black patient's pain less, even though it's the same scenario as the white patient. They were more likely to give the black patient less pain medication, right? So, you know, it, this is all about dehumanizing us, not recognizing us as human, as human beings, right? And that's what slavery did. That's how slavery could be perpetuated, right? The, the idea that you could own a human being. And so that, that's still what we're seeing today. That same ideology is impacting how health professionals care about their patients. Um, it's impacting how even you know, health professional students, health profession students are taught. Um, and it's so deeply, deeply, deeply ingrained that we know that one training, exactly. <laughs> two although, trainings. Although we get paid to do the trainings, we know that that's not gonna Right, we know that's not all that's gonna make a difference. And as I think that Dr. Joya may have mentioned, mentioned, you know, that's why we need policy change as well. I mean, we know the policy is gonna have the, big, the greatest impact on influencing outcomes. Yeah, thank you. And one question that I have is, I mean, obviously we're talking about racism, we're talking about implicit bias, and I mean, racial animus, you know, goes deeper almost than kind of this implicit bias, but is that the primary issue? Is it the systemic economic inequality that our community faces, or is it both? Do we have to have an either or? Would you, you want yeah, to? Yeah, sure, I'm happy to, to start. I, it's both. I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the short answer to it. I, as we think about, um, marginalized, under-resourced communities, what that means in terms of the facilities that they have access to, what, what that means in terms of the algorithms that are used to be able to allocate resources to, these, to people who are suffering or who need specific care. I mean, all of that is impacted by, um, by the economics. And then we think about the racial animus that, you've already, um, that we've already talked deeply about. I mean, it's, it's, they're inextricably linked, but I think the point that I often lift up um, when we have these types of conversations is that even that being the case, women who are from a higher economic standing or background still have the same right, risk right. That, we, that, we, that we encounter for those who are from a lower economic status. So it doesn't matter because race is so prevalent in the way that we make decisions 
It doesn't matter if you're a person who is a Medicaid patient or a person who is on a commercial insurance plan as to whether or not your outcome will be impacted by your race. Can, can I just, just to, to add to the reason that the maternal mortality crisis has gotten so much media attention, truthfully, is because of that data point. Um, about six years ago, um, we, with some funding and because of ProPublica and some journalism matters, I don't know if there's some journalists in there. Oh, of course. <laughs> Um, because they, they were asking for stories about, because the UN had sanctioned the US, there's a committee called the Committee of People of African Descent, and they go around the world to say, hey country, whatever country they're in, how are the black folks doing? How are the people of African descent doing? So when they came to the United States, they said, mass incarceration, bad, public schools, bad, and for health, they said, maternal health, bad, that black women dying at three to four times the rate of their white counterparts, no matter their income or their education, is bad. And the reason we even have that data is because the first time ever we disaggregated health data on race and economics and education. We have for so long completed these things. So we would say the reason black babies die, even my own organization when I started it, I was talking about black infant mortality and I was not discreetly saying racism was the cause. We were talking about a lot of things. We'd say social determinants of health. We would say, you know, we're using big words, but we had not gotten to the root causes of racism, classism, and gender oppression. So being able to show the CDC even re-looked at our data, because we've been using this data point now since 2016. So I'm sure that they thought they were going to redo it and we were going to be a lie. Guess what? We were not. It was even worse that black women are five times more likely to die in childbirth than their white counterparts with the same educational level. So we cannot buy or educate our way out of this. Racism is killing us. We cannot fix it with another, that's why another project, another, even our organizations cannot fix it until we unlearn a belief in a hierarchy of human value, until white folks stop believing that they are better because they have white skin, we are going to continue to die. So they are making, they are voting for things right now against their own interests and killing not only themselves, but us too. I don't want to die with these congressmen. I would, if they want to all go to Mars with Elon Musk, they can. I feel like this is the only planet we got. So making decisions that are killing themselves, I don't want to participate. So those are the kind of decisions that are killing us. No, I just, I just want to say something over um, Dr. Joya's point about, you know, this country and health outcomes that, you know, you mentioned that of, we have the, mo the worst maternal, maternal mortality rate of any high income country, but overall we are not doing well. Right. Right. And people need to understand this. And so when you say like even white people are not doing well, right. but it's when we think about who is advocating for certain policies, we see even poor white people advocating for policies that would har that harm them yes. because they don't want black people and other people of color to get certain certain benefits, public assistance, you know, public insurance. But that, what that leads to is everyone doing badly. So that's why we've seen even the overall life expectancy in this country drop for people in all racial demographics. Of despair. course, the most for black people and, and other people of color, but also white life expectancy has dropped over the last three years. So we are in very, very dire straits. And this is despite spending the most of any high income country on, um, on health costs. Right, so th that it, it makes no kind of sense. So, it, like, there is an there is an economic argument, and I hate the economic argument. Have to have to have because it's like a human argument, right? But there's an economic argument for changing how we are, you know, operating right now. Yeah, thank you. And I mean, one thing is for me, and every I've interviewed a lot of people on the, <laughs> the stage, but you know, I hate having this conversation in a silo. So I want to talk about reproductive justice more broadly. And Oriako, I want to start with you. You know, how does this fit into the conversation we're having now, particularly in the wake of the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade, of abortion bans popping up across the country? How does that impact the Black maternal health crisis that we're we're dealing with right now? Yeah, well, one thing I want to say about reproductive justice is, you know, the definition of reproductive justice is the human right yeah. to bodily autonomy. Um, it means you get to choose to be a parent, to not be a parent, and to raise your children in safe and sustainable communities. That is the, to me, that is what the baseline should be um, as far as how we're talking about any sort of reproductive health rights justice crisis that we're in. Um, 
you know, when thinking about how it's related to this current maternal health crisis, one of the things that I feel like gets so siloed within the reproductive health rights and justice movements is that when you hear reproductive health or reproductive justice, there's automatically this assumption that you're talking about abortion. Facts. Um, it, and it just, that's what it is. It's like abortion. The reality is that the 12 black women who founded the word reproductive justice in a hotel room in 1994, we're celebrating 30 years next year. So the 12 women who came up with this phrase, yes. Um, you know, when they were talking about how reproductive justice is the answer to this idea of a choice binary, it's they're talking about how it's not on a binary. It's not that you get to choose to be a parent or not to be a parent. It really does call us to use an intersectional lens to say, what are all the things, the issues that impact our decision-making process every single day? That means race, gender, your zip code, the climate crisis, the environment that you're in. Do you make a living wage? Are you getting a living or thriving wage? I mean, these are all things that come into the decision-making process when a majority of the folks who reach out to abortion funds, um, which are organizations that provide mutual aid all across this country for folks needing to either get abortion funding or logistical support around their abortion as well. So when folks reach out to us, a majority of them are parents. A majority of them already have at least one child. A majority of them are on Medicaid. So a majority of these folks are the people who are already feeling the brunt of the horrible reproductive healthcare conditions that we're in right now, adding on additional abortion bans, adding on the, now that we don't have the legal protection of Roe uh, protecting abortion, now it has exacerbated the situation around what it means to access care. Um, one thing I also need to mention too is, yes, Roe v. Wade gave us the legality, legal protection to access abortion, but it never guaranteed access. It never guaranteed that abortions would be available or clinics would be continue to be open. And it didn't do anything to say that we as a society are accepting the fact that abortion is health care. This is a natural part of a reproductive health care experience that anybody has. And so, um, you know, when thinking about this in a more holistic way, it isn't just this, like, we're just talking about abortion. We're talking about abortion and all the other things that come into play for why we are actually in this crisis that we're in today. And can I yeah, just, because yeah. I feel like we would be remiss sitting here at the great Mecca, Howard University, to not mention how Thurgood Marshall is the reason that we have any protection at all. If you think about when he, when Roe was passed 52 years ago, um, he was a Supreme Court justice on a Supreme Court with, at least they were honest back then. So the people who were on the Supreme Court with him were openly white supremacists, right? So they weren't pretending to be whatever these people we have now, including Clarence Thomas, who y'all can have. Um, you can give him back. Like, I don't count him as my second black justice. Y'all can have him. Anyway, so when he, when, when, the, when Roe v. Wade came up, there was a debate about viability, right? And so what Clarence, what, um, what? Thank you, Lord, I'm gonna take that. But Thurgood Marshall <laughs> was able to negotiate with openly white supremacists, legally white supremacist justices on the, on the court was to say, hey guys, can we at least agree that up until after viability, so he came up with this term viability. The truth is we don't have that term in medicine, it's made up. So we're trying to make something fit into a legal framework that Thurgood Marshall was just trying to keep us alive at the time, and at the time, because the physicians were old white dudes, like the dudes who were on the Supreme Court, they could agree to this viability language because they were like, oh, these little young, young ladies, none of us will do an abortion after 28 weeks because the viability 50 something years ago was 28 weeks. I have a son who's now 27 years old who was born at 22 weeks. Viability is all over the place. He weighed less than a pound. Now he's six something foot tall and eats all my food, right? So the, the point around viability is it's a slippery slope and it was never medical. So the six week stuff, 12 weeks, our Supreme Court Justice um, John Roberts is a liar or he's dumb. Because what he said was, every other high income nation, they don't pay for abortion, they don't, abortion is illegal after 12 weeks, that's a lie. Either his researchers don't know how to do research, it's free in every other high income nation up until 12 weeks because insurance is free in every other high income nation. So it just becomes, it's not just illegal, they pay for it with your tax dollars everywhere else. We are making up lies, lying to the American people saying that the other countries make it be illegal, and it's just not true. So they just say because it's free, after 12 weeks you should have to kick in, which I think makes sense. If you have waited, to, you know, if it's 13 weeks and you knew you could have had it for free, 
You maybe have to pay $100 copay. We are so far from the truth when it comes to the conversation about personal bodily autonomy. And if it were not for Thurgood Marshall, the liars who were in the court back then would have made it even worse. So we're just seeing a redoing of a legal conversation that's really about power and control. That's all it's about. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't want to give Uche, do you have anything? OK, great. <laughs> All right, well, I can keep going on that if you want. No, 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 you're all good. I want to get to a really interesting yeah. topic, um, and this is specifically on oral health, um, which I really did not, even as someone who's covered this, did not know about the importance of oral health in the black maternal health crisis. And so I really want to hear um, your thoughts on this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. So I, I would I would want to take a, a quick audience poll. How many people in the audience think that your oral health matters when you're pregnant? Yay, All right, that's fantastic. Wow, that's fantastic. Okay. So I'm speaking to the choir here. Is <laughs> you know, part of what we experience um, in, as women, as women of color, is not enough conversations around this very topic. The, the point is that almost 60% of women during their course of pregnancy have some sort of oral health issue that could impact their baby. We know that gum disease in particular can cause preterm preterm births can cause low birth weight babies. And we also know that if care is not provided during the pregnancy period, that it can also lead to maternal morbidity and mortality. And so part of why I'm here, I'm an internist by training. I'm a physician that comes to this work and thinking about how do we ensure that the healthcare system that we want for ourselves and for the future is holistic and comprehensive. And when we leave oral health out of that conversation, we're doing ourselves a disservice, particularly on this topic. African-American women have higher rates of preterm morbidity and mortality, as we know, um, and there's the impact of oral health that influences that. We also know that black people in general go to see their dentists less, have less opportunity for coverage. And so part of the work that my organization is doing is ensuring that we are thinking about this access issue with a health equity lens. And so when we think about healthcare, particularly for African-American women, we want to make sure that we're thinking holistically, that we're having these kinds of conversations that we're sharing and that we're sparking the understanding of what does it mean when I'm pregnant? What are all the things I need to consider? When I ran a community health center in my previous job, one of the things that we did in our centering pregnancy model was bring dentists into that model bring the dentist into the model so that mothers understood how important it is to have your oral health taken care of while you're pregnant. We also have done an incredible amount of work in understanding where are the access issues. The access issues are occurring, and again, regardless of your economic stature, but also when you layer on racism and structural racism and the lack of access to care, we know that oral health is impacted in that way as well. So I've done a lot of work around the integration of care and behavioral health integration in particular, and there's so many parallels to how we think about oral health being siloed as to how we used to think about behavioral health being siloed. We now know how important it is for black and brown moms to have access to behavioral health, and in the same way, it's important for them to have access to oral health. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And we're about to move into a question and answer phase. Um, I did just want to ask one question um, of everyone, since this is about a blueprint for a better black America. And so I'll start with you, Joya. How do we create an America where black pregnant people feel safe and access the full spectrum of reproductive autonomy? I love this question, because um, that's what we all deserve, right? The feeling of being able to feel safe. And that's what's missing for black people in general, if we think about police violence and all those other things, but how that shows up in hospitals is really our maternal mortality outcomes and maternal health outcomes. So some of the answers are in the Momnibus. I have to plug in for the Momnibus. If there are any people in here who are legislators, we have 12 bills that we've been trying to get passed for three years that include things like funding for um, birth centers. So as we know, we have um, maternity deserts. Um, we know that there are, we need more midwifery. There's money in there for midwifery. Um, there's money in there for social terms of health. There's the Kira Jones Act. So please look up the Black Maternal Health Caucus. And um, really, we have the solutions. People who are in the communities, we, we are only here despite trying to eugenics and white supremacy because we've been figuring it out for ourselves without investment. Imagine what we could do if you actually invested in the people, the reproductive justice groups, the researchers, the folks that, who were doing equity work, if we actually had the funding to lead it ourselves, then we would all feel safe. Instead of trickle down economics, we would have trickle up love. So that's what we would need. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, that's a hard one to follow. Because, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I, I, for me, it all in many ways goes to policy. 
right? Because when we think about the policy and we talk, we started off our discussion today talking about systemic racism and the impact, and it all goes down to who are making the decisions? How do we empower our patients and our communities to ask for more, to demand for more, to ask for more from their physicians, more from their caregivers, understanding what their rights are? So for me, it's around empowerment and around partnership and bringing everyone to the table so that they can understand and fight for their rights. And I think what we're, I think one of the goals today is so that every person in this room leaves this room and talks about what you've heard today so that we can continue to empower our communities. Because once we know, it's hard to unknow. Exactly. And so I'm, and, and it's hard to sort of step back and say, well, why, why shouldn't I have access? Why, why am I being treated differently? And you begin to demand that things need to change. So I'm, I'm excited to be part of this conversation, but I do think it goes down to policy. Yeah, I love this question. I feel like my head is in the clouds a lot because when I think about the current conditions that we're in, I just keep going back to like, surely this is not my ancestors wildest dreams. Right. Like, this, there's no way <laughs> Snap. that this is what <laughs> that this is what we have come to this point. So I come to this with a lot of grounded optimism um, and really thinking about how. Yes, there's policy, yes, there's different things that we can do, but the reality is that the courts have shown us time and time again that our best interests aren't necessarily at the core of what they intend to do. So for me, being working at the on the grassroots, I really am like, we have this collective responsibility right now to show up and show out for our people. And that means really taking the time to understand, I mean, understand the history of how we got here, understand that there's no way that we can work towards our collective liberation without acknowledging that like we have been living in a traumatic and harmful environment that is rooted in anti-blackness and racism and capitalism and all this really intricate ecosystem of oppression that has got us to where we are today. And I still have hope for this future that like this is not it. There's so much more that we can do. And part of that is, you know, talking to each other, talking, having the really difficult conversations, not being afraid to talk about the hard things with each other. Because until we do that, I mean, I'm in the practice of like pretending, not even pretending, but acting like we're achieving liberation now. Like if we're there, if we have this mindset of where we want to go, what would it look like? How would we be in relationship with each other? How would we advocate for ourselves at that moment? That's what I go to um, when I think of what is part of the blueprint. And especially with abortion access work, for me, if I hear one more person say, Rose, the floor, not the ceiling, I, I feel like my head might explode a little bit because I'm like, if we're trying to build this political home that is rooted on what we've just heard is made up work that we just heard that is rooted in white supremacy, I can't envision a future that is built on a foundation of that. So really clearing the land, rooting ourselves in the reproductive justice framework and building from there is what I see as part of this blueprint for our collective liberation. Okay. So. Thank you. Um, so I just, I know we don't have a lot of time, but I just want to tell a little story. I think Dr. Joyer probably heard it before, but <clears throat> it was a, you know, a few weeks after the pandemic started in New York City, I was, I was seeing patients. I remember walking into this one exam room and there was a young woman sitting on the exam table with her head down in her hands. And I was, where I was covered in PPE, PPE, personal protective equipment, head to toe at that time. There was so much we didn't know, like literally head to toe. So I walked in the room and I said, hi, I'm Dr. Blackstock. And she looked up at me and she said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. She said, are you black? She said, I just want to make sure. And I said, yes. And you should have seen, she let out the biggest sigh. And she said, OK, I just want to make sure I'm listened to. And in that moment, I felt angry, I felt proud. I felt proud I could be that person for her. I felt angry that any patient at their most vulnerable would feel that way. So more broadly, you know, our patients deserve a system, a healthcare system where they do feel respected, where they feel seen, appreciated, and valued. And right now, that is not the case. So they're definitely, you know, all of these wonderful, like the Momnibus Act, we need to make sure we push that through Congress, we, we need to change the way that our health professionals are educated and trained. We need to also change the way we, what we think about what health looks like. 
um, that health is not just what happens within an exam room. It can happen outside of a healthcare institution. It can happen at home. And also thinking about, you know, what we call the social determinants of health, you know, employment, housing, um, education, all of the other factors that impact how healthy our communities are. Because we know, especially for black women, that it, you know, living at the intersection of racism and sexism, that you know, we often get hit the hardest. And, and we're seeing that. We're seeing like, like these maternal health, health outcomes are the manifestation of policy decisions. And we know that most of these deaths and complications are preventable. So, and that's the part that really should, that it really is unconscionable. Um, so when we think about all of the changes they need, that need to happen, it, it's multi-level, multi-level. Um, it's complex, but it can happen. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Honestly, this was an incredible conversation with people I am so glad that we were able to, to have this with. And I think everyone here um, added so much. Um, and now we're about to break for lunch. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, but yeah, thank you all as the audience so much for being here and for your wonderful questions and all that you added to the conversation as well. Thank you.